You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you've got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? So, Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you for making time to be on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you and your audience, and it was, it was great to meet you in Seattle, too. Absolutely. We had a great time. Luke is the man. He did a wonderful job. Yeah, yeah he, really, he always does. He's, he is the man. Yeah, he's the best. So, Joel, I, I want the listeners to understand who you are and how you came to do your energy system work in HRB, so you can give us a brief background. That would be terrific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's been 20 years um, of, of really both now, so I'll try to keep that in the, the shortest time frame possible. But uh, I started back in the early 2000s, and, and I was like a lot of strength coaches. I was heavy on the strength and, and not so much on the conditioning. Uh, when it started out at the University of Washington with their football program, I interned at the Seattle Seahawks for a while, worked under a coach named Bill Gillespie, who's a multiple world time record powerlifter uh, or world uh, record holder in powerlifting. Um, and then 2003, uh, I opened a gym, and that's really where my entire career changed. So I opened a gym that happened to be next to an MMA gym called AMC Pancration, which I didn't know at the time, uh, but that gym is run by Matt Hume, and Matt Hume is, is really the best MMA coach of all time. So very, very quickly, I had these high-level, you know, world-level, world championship-level guys coming over to my gym and asking if I could train them for fights. Uh, the first guy was named Ivan Salivary. He was getting ready for a K-1 fight in Japan. And, you know, coming from a, a strength football-type background, my first thought was, well, I'm just going to see, you know, what this guy can do. And I put him through a bunch of strength tests, and he sucked. He was really weak. Like, couldn't do more than a couple pull-ups. Like, couldn't bench or squat his body weight. Just really weak. Uh, and if Ivan's listening, he, he will agree. <clears throat> and so... You know, my, my thought is, okay, well, I just need to make this guy really strong. Like, he'll be, he'll kill everybody because he's so weak now and he's, he's already really good. So if I make him stronger, he'll be way better. And so I put together this big strength program. And then I thought, well, I should go train with Ivan. And, like, I need to start understanding the sport a little bit better if I'm going to train these guys. And so I, I, I basically grappled with Ivan. And I overpowered him for, like, 10 seconds. And then I was completely gassed out of my mind. Uh, and it was just a really big eye-opening experience. Uh, that you know, all the strength in the world didn't do me any good because I was far stronger than Ivan, but I had no conditioning. And so it really mm -hmm. just started this big head first dive into understanding energy systems, understanding conditioning, understanding combat sports, and that entire world that I was very unfamiliar with. And, and really, at that point in time, there weren't that many people training combat athletes, you know, 2003, 2004. So I just had to dive in. I did, you know, you trial and error and experiment and read research and, and talk to anybody I could, you know, I asked the fighters, other coaches, what they've been doing, just really had to dive in and study it. So that was one big thing uh, that drove my career forward and changed the trajectory. And then the other one is, is actually before I opened my own gym, I was introduced to HRV. Um, I think it's like 2001 or so. And this is, there was, it's a system called the Omega Wave. And at the time, it was a laptop and it was six electrodes and it was $35,000, which was way more money than I had at the time. But I basically helped the, the group introduce it to the U.S. and some other coaches I knew through the University of Washington and then the Seahawks. So, you know, I worked to deal with these guys to get this HRV system. But again, there really wasn't much information on HRV. I got like a one-day training course and they're like, here, go use this thing. And, and the Omega Wave... This gave out a ton of data. It gave out like, you know, 18 different metrics every time you measured HRV. So it was not the simplest system in the world. And again, there really wasn't anything out there about it. So I just kind of had to dig in and I had to do the same thing with, with conditioning. I had to learn. I had to study everything I could find. I had to read research. I talked to researchers. You know, I found every coach I could find or, or person that used HRV. I talked to them, you know, just a lot of trial and error. So really kind of those two big factors of, of using HRV early on and then also being able to train really high level combat athletes who have a very high need for both conditioning and they need to be able to recover or they're gonna fall apart before they even get to their fight. Uh, those two things really shaped my career. So that pushed me down that path of um, becoming on the you know more well-known in the conditioning side, 
I started writing uh, in 2008 and 9, so I wrote the book Ultimate MMA Conditioning to just get out there in the audience and the world what I'd been doing and what I'd learned because the sport of MMA grew exponentially and there, there was a lack of really good information about how to train it. Um, and then I realized how valuable HRV was, but there really wasn't a system out there. So 2011, I created Bioforce HRV, which is one of the really early, you know, consumer level app because, you know, Omegaway was, was for organizations and teams. It really wasn't for individual people, but there was such a big need for it that I created, you know, one of the early systems. And that again was another turning point. So it's just been a, a long journey of, of coaching people, learning the process of, of how the body adapts to stress and recovery by using HRV and other data, and then trying to help other people recognize how to improve you know, their health, their, their HRV, their conditioning. Because the, the biggest thing that you can see when you dive into this, it's, it's all related. You know, HRV mm-hmm. is related to conditioning, conditioning is related to HRV. And both of those are for important for everybody, not just for athletes or, or people that are trying to perform at a high level because conditioning is a crucial part of, uh, you know, survivability and health and wellness. There's, there's a paper that just came out on HRV and COVID that shows, uh, especially the older populations, people with higher COVID have much greater survivability. So it really translates, you know, into every area of fitness. It's, it's not something that, again, you, you only need to know about if you're an athlete or you only know about if you're trying to perform. It's, it's, you know, those two facets of the game, you know, HRV is a big piece of recovery. And conditioning is a big piece of, of all types of performance, even just looking and feeling your best. So mm-hmm. um, you know, that's essentially kind of my my journey story and, and how I've gotten here. I've done a lot of different things on the way, like you mentioned in the in your talk or your intro. I've done stuff with big teams and organizations across you know most spectrums of sports and consulted with military groups. And you know, as, as you get into the data and recovery and the conditioning, there are areas that people want to know more about. And so I've been really fortunate to be able to to work with a lot of big organizations and teams and, and travel the world. Um, you know, just, just sharing what I've learned and, and helping other people understand uh, the recovery and the HRV and the conditioning side better. Understood. That was awesome. <clears throat> Thank you for catching us up. So I, I really wanted to have you on because you are a specialist in H, HRV. And I want you to kind of take us down this rabbit hole of understanding HRV because there's a lot of misconceptions out there and there's a lot of misinformation, as, as I, I said in the intro. And you've worked so hard to debunk a lot of those myths and, and kind of get us on the uh, straight and narrow with what re- HRV readings and data can really do, not only can really do for us, but how to interpret it. Yep. So yeah, whatever you know, you'd like to begin, please. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny when I, when I first started measuring it and I'd, you know, go to a conference and I'd say, Oh, I use HRV. People would like give me a blank stare. Like I had an STD or something was wrong with me. Right. <laughs> like it was, it was not what they, you know, they just didn't know what I was talking about. So it took a while for it to become more mainstream and there's been good and bad things about that. The good thing is it's obviously much more accessible and it's easier to measure and people, you know, track it daily basis. Millions of people, Apple, you know, has in their watch. Even mm-hmm. the bad thing I think is, you know, as anything becomes more commercialized and becomes uh, more mainstream, you know, it's easier for the, the utility and the real value and the information to kind of get lost in translation as these big companies just kind of spread it far and wide without as much care about how people use it. So, just to give you the the thousand foot view, um, HRV is a way of measuring what your body's doing in in response to stress. So we have to kind of talk about both stress and recovery to really understand uh, what HRV is. So the first thing is your body is constantly exposed to different types of stress, right? It's you've got the mental stress of life, you've got the physical stress of training, and you got nutritional stress and sleep. You got all these different forms of stress that you're just putting your body under on a daily basis. Now, at the same time, your body has to produce energy to deal with that stress and to keep your body alive. And the body basically manages both of those through what's called the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system has two branches that people have probably heard uh, in some capacity. The first is the fight or flight system, and that's the sympathetic nervous system. And that system really cranks up energy production and it distributes it to the body where you need it to produce more force, more power and deal with stress more effectively. So if I go to the gym, I lift weights, my sympathetic nervous system kicks on and produces the energy I need for my muscles to contract and for me to produce force and power um, and do what it is I need to do. Even if I'm sitting there thinking something very mentally stressful, I need a little more energy. My brain's consuming more energy. So the sympathetic nervous system contributes there. It's always working. Now, on the other side of that, you have what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's really the counterpoint to the sympathetic nervous system. It turns on and functions to drive energy into recovery, repair, 
uh, restoration, adaptation, and all the things that we see make us better from a fitness standpoint. So it's, it's got to make sure it's, you know, building the immune system and it's re doing the reproductive system, it's doing all these things that are anabolic in nature. So a lot of people have heard those terms. The sympathetic system is catabolic, meaning it's breaking down stored energy and making sure you have the energy available to use right now. And the parasympathetic system is the anabolic side of it. And it's producing energy, to, or it's putting energy into storage and into tissues, basically, which is what makes it bigger, stronger, and, and all those sorts of things. So you've got these, these two parts of the system always working in the background, right? We don't think about it. It's just always happening. And HRV is basically allowing us to tap into that process and see what's happening kind of under the hood. And the way that's doing that is it's measuring the activity of that parasympathetic nervous system. I said, we can call it like the rest and digest uh, system. And it's giving us an idea of how active that system is. And if we look at as a whole, it's also telling us kind of how well developed that system is. So the way that it's doing this is by measuring the amount of time from one heartbeat to the next, right? So if we just look at your heart, it beats 60 times a minute. It just tells us it beats 60 times a minute. But if we, if we look further beyond that, there's a pattern to your heart rate. And that pattern changes depending on how active that parasympathetic nervous system is. When that parasympathetic nervous system is not very active, which generally means the sympathetic system is more active, then we see a very metronome rigid like pattern in the heart rate. And that would be considered low HRV, low heart rate variability. If we see a lot of variability in the heart rate pattern from one beat to the next over time, then you have higher HRV. It means the parasympathetic system is more active. It means your body is driving more energy into recovery and less energy into, uh, you know, immediate stress. So all the HRV systems out there are doing is measuring the time from one heartbeat to the next over some period of time, and then calculating how variable that is, and then translating that into a number. Now, this is important to understand because heart rate's universal. It's just beats per minute. Like if I hear 60 beats per minute from one heart rate system, it means the same thing as 60 beats per minute from another heart rate system. Mm -hmm. The challenge of HRV, on the other hand, is there are multiple ways to calculate HRV. There are 12 or 14 kind of different standardized metrics that can be calculated to be considered HRV because there's lots of ways to measure that variability. It's not just a, you know, equal one way to do it. So if I get an HRV number on one system out there and I get an HRV in another system, I can't compare those two numbers because they could mean totally different levels of variability. There, there's not a standardized way of every, you know, every app or every system out there measuring, quantifying and reporting HRV the same way. So it's important to understand if you're using Aura or, or Polar or Garmin or Whoop or whatever, or my, or my app Morpheus, the HRV number you get is not like a standardized scale to compare yourself. It's the app itself is quantifying and giving you an HRV number. And then it's up to the app to basically turn that into something that's meaningful. Okay. So understanding that, you know, is valuable because you, again, you hear people talk about my HRV number is this and my HRV number is that. Well, without any context, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the grand scheme of things here, the goal, like I said, is to understand how the body is changing in response to what you're doing to it over time. And there's been some misconceptions in how HRV tells that story, right? So the common mm -hmm. belief is like, okay, if my HRV is higher, well, that's better. I'm more recovered. If my HRV is lower, that's worse recovered, right? I mean, it makes sense, but it's not always that simple because if we go back to what we said, when HRV is going up, it means your body is putting more energy into recovery. Well, that means it's still going through the process of recovering. What, what actually happens is if you started at a baseline and then you worked out, your HRV would go down because you were working out and your sympathetic system was kicking on. Then as you went through the process of recovering, your HRV would go back up. It would go back up higher than where your baseline was because it's deriving the energy to recover from that workout. Mm -hmm. And that last piece, the HRV would come back down to normal, basically where it started as you finished that recovery process. So your body is constantly going through these cycles, these stress recovery cycles, and your right. HRV basically reflects that. So it's telling you where you are in that process, in that cycle. And we can't just always make these blanket statements, high is good, low is bad. That's, it's not quite that simple, um, mm -hmm. but you know, hopefully it gives you a big, bigger picture of, of how the general uh, process right. of HRV works or what it's doing. Right. And have, have, have we seen 
like some of the findings and you, you have so much data on this and we can talk about the, your Morpheus um, uh, device that, that, that tracks uh, HRV. What are the, and, and I'm not asking you to start ripping other brands, but what are the downsides to measuring HRV off a wrist as opposed to a chest strap, if any? Sure. Yeah, wrist versus chest strap. I mean, there, there are definitely differences. The, the chest strap is always going to be the most accurate. So we, we measure accuracy in terms of like milliseconds of accuracy. So it's plus or minus like one millisecond if you were to compare it to like a clinical grade ECG machine. So chest strap okay. is very, very accurate. So it can, it can measure that different difference from one heartbeat to the next with plus or minus one millisecond of accuracy. So that's very accurate. Mm -hmm. The best optical sensors are plus or minus about two milliseconds. So definitely less accurate, but still more than accurate enough for the vast majority of people out there, aside from clinical research type settings. But the reality is there's a big difference in terms of the number or in the quality of those sensors, because those are the best sensors, but not everybody is using the same sensor because Morpheus uses the best sensor out there. And I can tell you the problem is it's an expensive sensor relative to what you can get. So if you're making a device, you want to save a few bucks, you get a less accurate HRV sensor. It can actually save you four or $5 a device, which can translate into a lot of money if you're selling thousands of these devices. So right. the, the quality of the sensor matters. Um, but the, the, the bigger difference I would say is, is the difference between what I would call active HRV measurement and passive HRV measurement. Now, again, when I was introduced to HRV through the Omega wave and then my own app BioForce, all of it was based on the idea that you want to measure HRV first thing in the morning in a standardized environment because right. you want to see where the body is today versus where the body was yesterday versus where the body was two days ago. And it's a very similar thought process to how you'd measure someone's body weight. If you wanted to say, I want to lose weight or I want to gain weight or whatever, you would get up in the morning and you'd measure yourself, you know, in a consistent manner, right? You would try to measure yourself before you've had a bunch of food, or you've drank a bunch of uh, water or whatever. You'd want to see where you were each morning in a standardized state, because that would give you the clearest picture over mm -hmm. whether or not your numbers were going up or down. If you tried to weigh yourself randomly throughout the day or middle night or whatever, you'd have a much more difficult picture because it would just be kind of reflecting what you just did. If you just ate a bunch of food and, and hydrated yourself, your weight would go up. If you went a bunch of hours without food and you moved around a bunch, your weight would go down. It wouldn't give you kind of this true moving picture of the trend of where your body was going. It would just be noise of what you just did recently. So the, the active HRE measurement, like I said, that, that I use and that really... 50, 60 years of research is based on um, is I have to sit down and take a measurement each morning because then I can compare where I am today versus where I was yesterday with the same general conditions. Now, the other side of it is passive HRV measurement, right? That's what Oura and Whoop and Apple Watch to some extent are doing. They are just measuring HRV passively in the background. And by passive, I mean, you don't actually have to do anything. It's just measuring it. The, the challenge with that is you don't really know when it's measuring it. So it's very hard to know if that data is standardized and you have a much hard time comparing where you were today from where you were yesterday. And now some of them will then just say, okay, well, we're going to measure it overnight. Okay, well, that's fine. There, there's some research that supports measuring overnight, but the problem is those sensors that it uses uh, require quite a bit of battery to measure HRV. So they don't actually measure it all night. Now, if you could get a stream of data from HRV all night, overnight, like all night, you get really good data, but you mm -hmm. can't because you'd burn the battery out in, in, in one night, basically. So mm -hmm. instead they take these little like 10 second or one minute clips uh, periodically, and then they average it out across the night. Um, and there's pros and cons to that, right? It's, it's much easier, obviously, but I think you lose a fair amount of accuracy and it can be tend it can tend to dis you know, distort the results a bit because you're not getting a complete picture. If you're on your stomach for one night, versus on your back for a different point of night or you're on your side, like you do body position changes HRV, how you're sleeping changes. A lot of things will influence HRV. So just because your sleep doesn't necessarily mean you're completely standardized unless you were to measure the entire night. So I think the, the two biggest factors, like I said, it's, it's the sensor, the sensor does matter. And then it's how you measure HRV that matters. And, and the more you can get standardized data, the more meaningful that data will ultimately become. So okay. it's up to also, you know, the, you know, I would say Whoop and Aura and all these companies that are giving you the HRV number, like the majority of them are turning in Morpheus as well, are turning that into a recovery score of some sort because they know that it's 
you know, it's not going to be easy for the average person to really interpret, you know, HRV without some additional help from the app. So yeah. you basically have to just trust them that they know what they're doing and that they're using that HRV to help guide or drive that recovery score, which you can then interpret a bit easier than looking at the changes up or down in HRV. But I think it's important to, to look at both because that, an HRV going down, you know, is different than HRV going up. They can tell you different things. So I think it's important yeah. to not just have the HRV number, but to understand what that's telling you as well. Mm -hmm. So and, and thank you. It, so HRV in itself can, can you break this down? I mean, it sounds simple after you uh, just explained that wonderful tutorial to us, but HR, having a, a great HRV score will, in essence, they, be it through Morpheus, will, will help us understand what, how to tax our body or modify our training the next day. So it doesn't necessarily mean you won't train, it just may, you may take down the volume. Is that correct? Yeah, look, I, I think the best way to think about it is first of all, I mean, before I get there, again, a lot of people will make this assumption that if, you know, if my HRV is a certain point, it, it basically means that like I can or I can't train hard. Like, oh, my HRV is too low. I can't train hard today. Or if I do, then, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it's not telling you what you can do. It's more or less telling you more like what, what you should do because what it's really doing is predicting how long it'll take you to get back to normal after a given level of stress. And what I mean by that is, let's say I was to do a really high intensity, heavy workout. Now, if my HRV was telling me I'm, I'm, I'm highly recovered, then let's say I can do that workout and I can recover in let's say 48 hours, just to give you an example. Mm -hmm. But if I was starting from a lower point of recovery, that same workout might take me three full days to recover and get back to normal. So it's telling me how much energy reserves, I guess is the best way to think about it, I have available to train. And if I already have a low level reserve, it's just gonna take me longer to recover. So it's it's basically telling me, well, if you do a really hard session, how long is it gonna take you to recover from that? And that helps me make better decisions. Like if I wanna train consistently, then I don't wanna take four days to recover from one hard workout because I'm gonna overtrain if I try to work out more often than that. So it's, it's predicting or giving you a really good gauge of how much more stress you can recover from without incurring this huge cost, this huge debt of it taking a long time mm -hmm. to get back to normal. So that should help people guide their training decisions. If, if I'm already down that recovery process and my fatigue is already high and I do another high intensity or high volume, high stress workout, then I'm just, again, kind of pushing myself further down the hole and it's gonna take long to get back up to normal. And mm -hmm. part of the magic of training is training and recovering and repeating that process as many times as you can. The, the more times you can go through that process of train and recover, the better your results are gonna be. If, if it takes you four days to get back to normal, you can't train very effectively because your recovery is the limiting factor there. So ultimately it, it gives us that picture because you just have to remember recovery is the limitation in the gains you make. It's, it's not the training side. The training stimulates the body to get better, right? But the recovery is the limitation because if you don't recover, recovery is where fitness is improving. So if you don't go through that process of recovery, that means you don't get bigger muscles or it means your mitochondria don't grow and, and multiply so you can't have better aerobic fitness. Right. You know, recovery is where the changes in your body are happening that lead to better fitness. So if those aren't happening, I don't care how much you're training, you're not getting the improvements. So it's, it's yeah. showing us where that limitation is. And I always just mm -hmm. say that recovery sets the upper limit for how much you can train. And right. if you train more than that, you're not going to get better and you're eventually going to get worse if you keep doing that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's helping us understand where that level's at. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. People, I think that was such a powerful statement. It's not, I think the everyday uh, gym goer, fitness uh, professional, they, they need to understand that it's not that you can't push through training, like pushing through training is you for people who love fitness and training you is never a problem. It's more, what is that going to cost you? Is, is that exactly? Correct? Yes, that yes, exactly. And that's really kind of the best way to look at HRV. If, if we look at HRV as in this measurement of cost, it's measured It's the changes in HRV are telling us kind of the cost of the stress that we've put our body under recently. So if we are seeing these big changes, both up and down, it means our body has been through a lot of stress and recovery. It means there's been a big cost to that. And that's going to help us understand what we have left over to keep moving forward. So 
again, it, it, and, and the big, biggest thing I understand too is because of that, HRV is not just responding to the workout, right? It's it's responding to all the stress. So if you don't get enough sleep, if your if your diet is terrible, if you're traveling, if you're under a lot of mental stress, um, all of these things are stress. Like they all take the body's energy reserves to deal with, or they they take time away from the recovery process, right? Sleep is when you're the most recovery driven. It's when your body's the most anabolic and parasympathetic so if your sleep is suffering you're spending less time recovering you're going to pay the price for that and your mm -hmm. hrv will fuck that so it's it's showing you the cost mm -hmm. of everything you've been doing to yourself and then again that's going to help you understand what's the cost to do even more in this in this workout so it's it's not again but it's, it's never that you can't go smash yourself i mean you can it's more of a question yeah. of should you do that like what's the price going to be if you do that like right. yeah you can have five glasses of wine every night but there's a cost to doing that. And HRV will show you that cost because your HRV will tank because your sleep will suffer as, you know, as a result of that. So you see the cost of your decisions is what it comes down to. And that can help a lot with accountability and just better decision making. So sleep makes a massive difference. You know, what you eat and what you drink makes a huge difference. Mental stress makes a huge difference. And I've got endless stories of looking at, like, for example, we look at college teams, college soccer teams. And I've looked at the HRV during like a tournament, like a, like a season level national tournament. And we look at the stress on the athletes during that three or four day soccer tournament. And then we looked at the stress during finals week. Finals week was more stress on the athletes than these soccer tournaments was. And you would think, well, they're not even that training during finals week, <laughs> right? But finals week is more stressful yeah, than, yeah. you know, a three day soccer tournament at a collegiate level. Um, and I've seen that data mm -hmm. in multiple places. Mm -hmm. We looked at in military settings and corporate settings the the mental stress side of the game the sleep side of the the nutrition it's really where all the magic actually happens because again it's what ultimately determines mm -hmm. how much energy your body can devote towards the recovery side of it and that's what's going to determine again whether or not mm -hmm. you see the improvements from your actual training and that's that's a big big piece of this so mm -hmm. you know aside from the training side you know you want to use hre to be able to make better decisions and more mindful of everything that happens outside the workout after the workout, because it's going to show you the result of, of mm -hmm. all that as well. Got it. Got it. Uh, that was, that was great. So have you found, I mean, you, you, you've worked with so many military groups, like special forces in different organizations. Have there been findings where people can, um, I guess, for example, the special forces or the special forces candidates, have they just pushed themselves and forced themselves to develop, to, it's, everything's about stress and adaptation, um, to, to have they forced themselves in a place where they can handle an incredible amount of stress and that in turn would not affect the HRV numbers as much just because they from the qual quality of their experiences that now they're force recon or Navy SEAL, what have you found any like significant findings working with those teams? Yeah, look, I mean, in, in general, um, HRV as a whole, if you look at kind of your average baseline number, it gives us a very good gauge of your overall resilience, right? Because it's telling us how well that parasympathetic nervous system can turn on and deal with recovery. So people in general, with higher levels of HRV at rest, baseline kind of averages over time, can deal with much greater levels of stress and all over the place and still get themselves back to normal from it. So there's been a fair amount of research by the military actually. They, they did uh, a big one where they looked at survival school basically and they looked at this, this big program of, of you know, being basically put through these huge levels of stress and they wanted to figure out, could we figure, can we determine who's going to make it through these courses versus who's going to wash out? Right. And right. the biggest thing they found was that the pattern of HRV was the best predictor of that. So they wanted to, you wanted to have a high HRV at rest, meaning your body was able to turn that system on very effectively. And then you wanted to have a low HRV, meaning your heart rate was up and your adrenaline was pumping when you needed it to be during the activity, during the stressor. Because what happens is if you burn yourself out, one of the first thing that happens is your body starts decreasing the ability of that sympathetic system to turn on as well. Because... It's like, man, I'm putting so much energy into stress. This is really killing me. So I'm going to put less energy into stress. It just puts less energy in that sympathetic system turning on. And then you're just performing worse because you don't have the it's just you survival, right? Yeah, exactly. Survival. So it's a survival. It's exactly what it is. So 
the military basically realized like the you know the soldiers who could consistently keep their HRV higher during the rest periods and then consistently turn that stress system while they needed it they're the ones who made it through survival school and that's also why you, you know you see endurance athletes who have ridiculous train volumes have high HRV levels so as a general rule if you have a higher baseline HRV it means you have a greater work capacity it means you can sustain higher training loads it means you can deal with mental stress more effectively it also means you can you can make better choices. There's research that shows people with higher HRV have an easier time sticking to their diets. They have an easier time, you know, wow. making better choices about alcohol because it's correlated to your self uh, control basically. So the the challenge here again is you can't compare one HRV system to another. So you have to kind of mm -hmm. know what's what's high versus what's low, and that can depend entirely. It does depend entirely on what system you were actually on because you need to know what's what's a good number for your age group. Uh, on the system you're using to know if you're higher, you're lower, you're average. But in general, mm -hmm. higher HRV uh, as a baseline number is a very, very good indicator of your overall work capacity, your stress, you know, resilience, all those things. And mm -hmm. that's another reason why it's an important thing to track because it, it correlates to things that are, are meaningful. Got it. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you went down that, that, that street. So now I feel that people are so heavy into training, like, you know, we're, I'm in gyms all day and I see people want to do the HIIT training. They want to crush their legs. They want to do circuit training. And then I see people just bounce. Like, I don't see like anyway, like anyone really down regulate. I don't see anyone, um, for that matter. You, look, look, we have sanctuary, we have cold plunges, we have saunas here. You don't see a large piece of the population in fitness and wellness of the people who really get after it do any sort of uh, breathing or diaphragmatic breathing or, yep. you know, excessive recovery or say, you know what, I'm not training for two days. I think that we need to like put so much emphasis on that going forward. And they don't understand, as you said before, that's the qual that's going to determine the quality of your results. And if you're yep. constantly in the sympathetic, you're, you just, you're, you're turned on, you're less efficient when you do turn on. So how do you, what, what do you tell athletes or what do you tell the people you work with and, and how do they, you transition them into doing some of those parasympathetic things? Yeah, so I really try to focus on getting people to understand this concept of what I call the stress recover recycle. So I, I call it train, recover, repeat as basically like, look, this is the model that we want to hang our hat on. We want to train and put our body under stress and then we want to recover so our body improves and then we want to repeat that over time. And I try to help them structure the week so then in general, you want two stress recovery cycles. Like you want two periods in the week where you put your body under load and then you allow your body to recover from that. And so I help people structure their training week with this idea in mind that, hey, Monday and Tuesday, we're going to load and we're going to put our body under that stress and we're going to train. And then Wednesday, we're going to give ourselves a chance to recover. And if, if someone doesn't have the time to do something active, then look, you're really going to focus on sleep. You're going to get enough movement in. You're going to do some breathing at home, some soft tissue, whatever. Or you're going to come in and do an actual recovery workout or the sauna or swim or whatever it is to promote that recovery. And then we're going to repeat mm -hmm. that process. Thursday and Friday, we're going to put the body under a second stress period, a training period. And then Saturday and Sunday, we're going to focus on the recovery and we're going to do these things. So I basically, like I said, I, I try to help people shift their mindset from thinking about training in terms of just the workout and recognize that training is also putting the time and energy into the recovery. And so I start building those things into their weekly plan, right? So Monday and Tuesday is this, Wednesday is this. That's why we're doing the recovery side Wednesday. You know, Thursday and Friday is this loading. Saturday and Sunday, here's how we're going to speed up recovery. So I just really get people's uh, emphasis and focus on not just, hey, here's sets and reps, but here is also the things that you're going to really do for recovery to improve that. And then again, using HRV helps keep them accountable because if they're paying attention, their HRV is, is showing them that they did the training and the recover, the training and the stress part, then they, they know they need to get their HRV back to where we want it to be before they do the next round. Because look, it really is, like I said, it really is as simple as you train and you recover and you repeat that over and over again. And it's how that balance between a training and recovery is over and over again that determines whether or not you're going to see improvements. If, if you train mm -hmm. and recover over and over again, but the recovery is cut short, you're not going to get better. I, I don't care how much you train. You're just not going to get better. So it's, right. it's about understanding that there's two pieces of fitness. It's not just working out. It's the recovery piece afterwards. So like I said, I think it's two things. It's, it's making them really aware of that and trying to help them build that mindset. And then it's being very clear in 
planning those things into their week. And I, I don't give really anybody a program that doesn't include all the recovery elements of the program in addition to the workout. It's just an un, you know, it's an inseparable piece. It's here's what we're gonna do to train. Here's what we're gonna do to recover. And that's just how I build my programs and try to get people's heads around it. And once they buy into the concept, uh, it's easy because they feel better and because they see better yeah. results, right? You know, once you once you kind of recognize, like, wait a minute, I don't have to be tired all the time. Like, I can see consistent progress. Like, my motivation stays high. You know, once once they see the benefits, then it's it's a lot easier to get people to keep doing it. Awesome. And, and, and sometimes I think that people don't understand that burnout could be you not feeling your sets. It could be you not feeling motivated to go in, uh, yep. you know, high irritability. They, 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 I think it comes a bit camouflaged or disguised when you're not recovering well. And, and, and you know, also, correct me if I'm wrong, if someone, you know, uh, Cognitive thought, you touched on it before, you know, people make better decisions, but if you don't have clarity, that could be from overtraining and not spending enough time in the parasympathetic, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have to understand, you know, the body wants to survive uh, and it's going to do everything Mm -hmm. it can to survive. And if you're putting in a ton of energy into the training and physical activity side of things, it's going to start trying to undermine that a bit and it's going to start you motivating you to be less active and, and to eat more and your mm-hmm. body basically. So something people really need to understand is your body has a limited amount of energy it can produce each day. And that's counterintuitive to most people. So if I go 20,000 steps, I don't automatically burn necessarily more calories than if I only went 10,000 steps. And that's a weird thing for people to think about. Now, yes, I put more energy towards activity, but I might have pulled that energy away from other areas of the body that would normally get it if I didn't go 20,000 steps. And that's exactly what happened. There was, there was a paper just came out recently that showed about 20, uh, 28%, I believe, of the activity or the calories you burn from activity don't lead to a greater t- total calorie output, meaning your, your body doesn't increase its total calories by you know, the total amount of, of energy that came to work, about 20-something percent. Uh, I think it's like the 27, 28% come from your basic metabolic rate. It pulls calories away from these basic biological functions. And what are those? Well, that's immune system, that's reproductive system, uh, that's basic maintenance of different organ systems. So your, your body can't just produce this like unending amount of energy to deal with all the stress you throw at it. It's, it's finite because your metabolism is, takes time to produce energy. It takes time and energy itself to break food down and turn into ATP that all our cells run on. Because it takes time to do that, there's only so much you can produce in a 24 hour period. So you got to understand you're working from this. It's like you're, you know, most people are, are money limited, right? Like, you know, you don't have an supply of money, so you can't buy everything you want. You make choices at the store about what foods you buy. You make choices about which restaurants you go to. You make choices about which car you buy because you have a limited supply of money. Well, it's the same thing, biologically speaking. Your body has a certain amount of money it can spend on en- or in terms of the energy side on everything to keep you alive. So, again, if you start spending, quote, unquote, a lot of your energy money on just massive amounts of training or too much training, it's going to try to get you to stop doing that. It's like, man, you're going, you're putting this into debt. So subconsciously it starts to demotivate through the dopamine system, going to the gym. It starts to demotivate you being active in general. It starts to motivate you to want to eat more food so you can breathe more calories in. So a, a lot of this stuff is subconscious, your body trying to you know protect itself. And I think the biggest thing that we see in the gym industry is inconsistency in people's training is usually a good sign mm-hmm. that that's part of the problem. Because if you can't train consistently because you're making yourself excuses and you're not showing up this day when you're supposed to, a lot of that is because subconsciously your, your brain was trying to push you to not be as active and to not train as hard, not put the body under mm-hmm. so much stress because it's just trying to survive. So I think that the subconscious yeah. is a really big piece of this. Um, and again, you, that's just the result of the body's defense mechanisms trying to get you to, to spend more time away from the gym. Mm-hmm. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Joel, but also, as we said before, you can actually push yourself to be small through a training session, but there's a, there's a host of other things happening. It, although you could push through it, I mean, you could just... When you have massive inflammation in your body and you're not allowing it to recover, 
yeah, maybe you feel like you got your workout in, but you don't realize that that massive inflammation is pushing yourself to other negative things, probably close, not, not that far down the road. Yeah, absolutely. So we can kind of, inflammation is a really important one. So when your body is, is in this sympathetically dominant state, dominant state, it's more sympathetic and you're producing more energy, your body becomes more pro-inflammatory, right? And that's by design. So when you train, you're creating little inflammation pockets, basically. Your, your muscles become inflamed. I inflammation is really just a marker that there's tissue damage here and you need to do something about it. Now, when you're in the recovery state, the parasympathetic system turns on and it's anti-inflammatory. So it goes to those muscle sites and those different cells that were stressed and it turns the inflammation off and it repairs them. And it's how the body communicates stress is the easiest way to think of inflammation. It's, it's the body's way of saying, hey, there's something that needs to be fixed here fix it. And then the parasympathetic system, the immune system does that. And then inflammation basically gets turned off. But what happens if you don't turn it off, right? What happens if you are so sympathetic and you, you don't have that balance, right? That the parasympathetic system can't do its job of turning off stress. That's where you go from this acute inflammation that's beneficial to chronic inflammation that's not, and that causes mm -hmm. lots and lots of problems. And it's also, they think, they think there's a big piece of that chronic inflammation that's sending the signal to the brain to do less. So when inflammation becomes more chronic and more sustained, these little proteins called cytokines travel to the brain from other areas of the body and say, hey, there's lots of inflammation throughout the body. You probably should do something about this. And that's where, again, it can make adjustments to your motivation and your desire to go train and everything else. And it's communicating basically from all parts of the body back to the brain what is going on. Mm -hmm. So that's a really valuable mm -hmm. thing. That's, that's, it, as we develop the parasympathetic nervous system, it basically means we're better at shutting off inflammation. We are more inherently able to mitigate inflammation. We're more able to recover as a result of that. And that's why people with higher HRV in general have low, much, much lower rates of cardiovascular disease, lower rates of diabetes. It's why the COVID paper likely showed that people with higher HRV and the older populations had much lower rates of, of basically, uh, you know, long-term hospitalization and death because they were able to shut the inflammation of COVID off. And it's this cytokine storm they call that people, people probably never heard cytokine storm in their lives until they talk about HRV or talk about COVID. But cytokine yeah. storm is just inflammation storm, basically. It's just a huge amount of inflammation. And again, if your body is a higher level of parasympathetic fitness, more or less, you can turn that cytokine storm off. You can prevent that from happening. So if you have higher HRV, it means, again, that's why you're more resilient, because you can turn off inflammation and manage it more effectively than somebody with lower HRV and less fitness. That, that's interesting. So the cytokines are going to the brain to try to talk you out of training to help you survive and make, let you know that you're not in a positive place to do this. Yep. And that's where exactly. the lack of motivation comes from, in essence. It Understand. is, yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, so, you know, it's unfortunate that people don't recognize the signs they're by they're telling them are there for a reason. And it's, 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 you know, usually you just right. don't recognize what your body's trying to tell you to do, but there's a reason it's doing that. Mm -hmm. So can you get into some of them with not giving away too many of your secrets or uh, whatever you're open to? Like when you build out the recovery model and you put those days in, what do some of those days look like? Yeah. So, Kind of the general framework I use is I use three levels of training day uh, to help guide volume intensity. So I have basically my highest intensity days. I call those a red day or sometimes what I call development day. And those are, again, those are the days where you're really going to get after it. You're going to train hard. You're going to push yourself to the limit. I've got a step down from that, which I call a green day or maybe a more moderate day. Okay, it's, it's, it's a hard day, but it's not a really hard day. So think of like, I got a really good workout, but I'm not trashed. And then I have my third day, which I call rebound day or recovery day. And a recovery day is usually like a 30 to 35 minute workout. It's mobility, it's breathing, it's low intensity cardio. You know, it's basically a workout where I should feel better at the end of that workout than I did when I started it. If I feel more movable and I feel more energized, I did it right. If I feel more fatigued, I did it wrong. And so I use those three days. And then obviously day of rest is the fourth kind of day. I use those to build training weeks. And so... 90% of the time, I don't have more than two of those really high intensity days per week, just because I found over and over again, using lots of data and just experience, the average human being cannot 
fundamentally recover well from more than two of those high intensity red days a week. Like it just doesn't work for your average person. Mm -hmm. Now, a professional athlete who's got everything dialed in and got the best genetics in the world, yeah, like they can probably do it for a while, you know, but even then our combat athletes that we trained up to the highest level in the world, we only had two days of, of sparring where, you know, you were in that red zone and you're really pushing yourself to the highest limit. So I try to basically start with like, okay, we're going to pick the two days of the week where we want to put those days in and then I build around it. So typically, you know, I'm going to have one or two of those red days for your average person. I'm going to have one or two of those more moderate days and I'm going to have one or two of those recovery rebound days. And then somewhere in there, you're going to have a day or two off. So I just structure the week around again, that concept of stress and recovery or train, recover, mm -hmm. repeat. And I build those low intensity rebound days into people's training schedules. And then mm -hmm. usually in the weekends, I'll put some sort of regeneration in there. So the weekend could be, you're gonna get the sauna, you're gonna get in the pool, you're gonna get a massage, you're gonna, you know, meditate and spend time doing that. You're gonna do something that's beneficial from a regeneration standpoint on the weekends to help recover. Because one really, really simple thing people can do is look where they start out each Monday and compare that. Because if you're starting a Monday fatigued, it means you didn't fully recover from the previous week. And it means you're more likely to not recover from the com upcoming week. So I tend to really use mm -hmm. this, this Monday morning benchmark of, did I recover from last week? How do I feel? What am I, you know, and make the decisions for that week based on that. Because again, the, the thing that happens again, overtraining does not happen in a couple of days. It happens over time as we gradually don't recover from all the work and then fatigue accumulates. It's that accumulation of fatigue, mm -hmm. the accumulation of inflammation that causes problems. So if we can look at each Monday and we can see, are we recovering from each week? That can help us make much better decisions. But again, I plan my training very intently and I want people to know, hey, today is a red day. We're going to go really hard. Or today is a green, more moderate day. You're going to go hard, but not hard enough to really push yourself to the highest levels. And you're going to stay probably below 90% of your maxes for the most part. Or, hey, today we're going to come in, we're going to do a rebound session, and we're going to leave feeling better. If people know the intent of the day and what we're trying to accomplish, uh, you know, I found that it just sets the, themselves up to be more successful and they're going to understand why they are doing that type of workout. And it's going to shift them away from this idea that anything in the gym that's not, you know, hard and heavy, you know, is, is useless. Like that, if they think that, that nothing outside of high intensity is beneficial, then they're not going to do right. it. So I get them to really understand here's the value of each category of workout. Here's why it's important. And here's how it's going to work together to make you better. And if they understand that, and they see the improvements, then it's, it's much easier, like I said, to get them to continue to do that. Right. So uh, two questions. Do, have, we, have you seen uh, many pro teams, college teams working towards this trend and actually paying attention to these numbers and, and making sure that they actually – it's one thing to like get the data and, and, and know the numbers, but I talked to a uh, – Division one college football strength coach recently. He's tracking these numbers. It's hard to get the head football coach to understand that, you know, these numbers mean you can't work them into the ground. And the coach is like, we got to get these practices in. So, yeah, we have the data, but we're not exactly paying attention to it. So it's a, it's a struggle between the strength coach and the person getting the metrics and the head coach, which that's they got to win games, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is a struggle. And I think the, the answer is it really depends on the organization. And there's a huge spectrum out there, right? I've seen well-run organizations that have a, a strength coach or a staff on the performance side that are very dedicated towards this. And they understand the importance of it. And the head coach listens. And it's a unified group that's making decisions and taking data into account. Uh, you have some where they have a big data department. And the head coach just pays no attention to it whatsoever, even though they've got a lot of data. And then you've got you know, people kind of in between. So, you know, I've seen, it's, it's just, there's, it's the wild west. There's a big spectrum and it, it's all top down, right? So it's, it's really whatever, as you know, the head coach, generally speaking, and the GM are going to set the tone of what they're going to do and what they're going to listen to. So, you know, it's, it's really kind of a, a very team specific thing. And like I said, I've seen both. I've seen all of it. I've seen teams that do a great mm -hmm. job of this. Um, I was just talking to Eric Otter, the Memphis Grizzlies, um, the other day, he was a really good, great guy. He's head of sports medicine there and, and talking about what they're doing. And they're they're looking at some data and they're, you know, they're trying to keep their players healthy because, you know, an MA player on the court is you know, often a difference maker. And so, you know, they take this very seriously and, and his job is to help keep everyone healthy and data plays a role in that. And then you talk to other teams and they're, you know, they're doing nothing at all whatsoever. So it really right. just 
you know, it depends. I think it's going to take time. Um, I think there's more awareness around recovery. I think teams are looking for more opportunities to have this. I mean, I've, I've had teams bring me in um, that I'd never dealt with before. So I, I think that teams are just more aware of the importance of recovery. You know, more players are, are wearing devices and are tracking things to some extent. So there, I think there's been, like I said, a good amount of increased awareness, but I don't know that's translated into a difference um, at, at, across all levels. It, it really varies. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, I think we're early days in this, you know, data has been around okay. for a few years now, but it's, it's going to take time, I think, before it becomes more of a standardized part of this, you know, like, I mean, look at baseball now, baseball 20 years ago, there was very little data involved in decision-making. And now it's, you know, some teams have built their entire dynasties on, on using data mm-hmm. to draft players and, and make those sort of personnel decisions. So, you know, I think as this stuff oh, yeah. gets better, you know, as this stuff improves and it gets easier to use and you have, um, you know, more knowledge around it, like the younger generation of coaches coming up, like it'll probably be just more ingrained in the culture as we progress forward. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, absolutely. That's good to hear. And, and also, you know, I think you, you start getting less and less old school coaches and the new age coaches kind of understand that, hey, if we're not recovered, we're not feeling that well, it's very likely that someone, maybe your star player, will get injured. Yep, exactly. And, you know, you've got, like, you've got the Tom yeah. Brady's in the league who are out there talking about the importance of taking care of themselves and recovering and putting mm-hmm. that work in. So I, I do think, like I said, it'll, it'll be a matter of time, um, but you will see more and more people gravitate, toward, gravitate towards it. And I will say in, in my experience, you know, the, the older athletes on the team now are tending to really focus on this stuff a lot more, and that will trickle down to the younger players as well because, you know, the younger players can learn from what the players that have been in the league for a while are doing. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I see a ton more contact and information being asked by the older athletes on the team because they know the price of of not recovering. And they've been around long enough to understand, like, they've got a few years left in their career. The more they can take care of themselves and stay healthy, the more money they're going to make and they can prolong their career a lot. So they get really, really uh, into it as they progress throughout their career. And then, again, I think the younger players are starting to see that and it'll just trickle down. So I think we're on the right path. Again, it's just it's just kind of early Mm -hmm. days still, I would say. Okay, understood. Uh, I just have to throw this in there. I know it's trendy. Um, do you find a in regards to recovery? We're talking recovery, saunas, cold plunges. Do you find um, you know the majority of your people that you're working with they really feel recovered? Or a, maybe a better question would be using cold plunges and saunas. Do you think that they improve the numbers significantly, or it's hard to tell? Um, they can. Uh, it, it depends on how you use them. So I kind of put those things, like those are all useful, but I put them in kind of the supplement category, right? Like you need to have your sleep and your training all dialed in, and then those can make a bit of a difference. But if your sleep is bad and your overall training isn't very good and your nutrition is not good, and then you just throw in some cold plunges and saunas, like, you know, it, it's not going to make a huge difference, right? So it's, it's the same thing. Like you've got to have your house in order before you worry about the details. Um, but in general, you know, a cold plunge is designed to, to mitigate inflammation a bit and turn it down. So if, if you are kind of trending towards that chronic inflammation state, it can help break that cycle. It can be a good thing. Um, if you use it every single day, it's, it's probably not going to have the same benefit and it could negate some things. Um, same thing with the sauna. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you spend the right amount of time in the sauna, you can help stimulate blood flow and you can get your body to turn on the parasympathetic system afterwards. If you spend an hour in a sauna and you dehydrate yourself, you know, that's not really recovery. So... It's it's the devils yeah. in the details of also how you do these things because like anything else you can you can use them intelligently and you can get a real benefit out of them or you can overdo it which is you know it's something that I've seen happen too like I said I've seen plenty of people go in the sauna for you know forty five minutes to an hour drop eight pounds of weight and come out and tell me they did a recovery sauna I'm like dude you're dehydrated that's <laughs> not that's not going to promote recovery <laughs> like you know I, I think yeah. that the they, general, need a, they need they need a weekend to recover yeah. from the sauna. Exactly. So look, I, I use a very simple guideline of, of whether or not it was likely beneficial recovery. How did you feel in the, you know, half an hour to hour after it? If you felt really good and energized and you felt better, uh, it probably was good for recovery. If you feel tired and run down and worse, it didn't help your recovery. It probably made it worse. So you can use that, that feeling because that, that really does translate pretty well because, uh, you know, when your body's under stress and you feel that effects, it's, it's, it's stress. It's slowing things down. If you feel really good and you feel uh, more mobile and more energized and more positive and you feel good, like that is a sign you probably did something well, probably did something uh, effective. 
Awesome. So uh, I only have you for a few more minutes here. Let's end with the 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 beginner or the maybe the gym goer who doesn't track HRV. Where can they start? And maybe this is a good time to introduce uh, Morpheus and tell us a little bit about Morpheus because I think that would be a great tool for everyone. Sure. Yeah. No. I mean, Morpheus is a great place to start. It's just trainwithmorpheus.com. But Morpheus gives you a three-minute recovery test every day where you measure your HRV. And it's not designed to be worn 24 hours a day like an Aura or a Polar or a Whoop or whatever. It's measured HRV in the morning, and it gives you that score. And then whatever activity tracker you want to use, so if you have an Aura or you have an Apple Watch or you have a Fitbit or whatever, it'll pull activity or sleep uh, and sleep from that data, and it'll pull it all in to, to give you a recovery score and some heart rate zones. And that's the biggest difference is, you know, Morpheus gives you this recovery score in your HRV every day, but then it helps adjust your heart rate training by giving you uh, three heart rate zones a day, uh, a blue zone for recovery, a green zone for conditioning, and a red zone for overload, your high intensity zone. So again, that's part of how I help people design their training programs is on those recovery rebound days, like I talked about, I want you to go do 20, you know, 25 minutes in your blue zone for recovery during your warm up and during your cool down from your training. I want you in that blue zone. So you can use it to help guide your training, not just look at the screen to get a recovery score HRV, but to then translate that into an actual heart rate uh, zone for the day. And then I'm actually working on some programs that people can start doing uh, that, that'll be built around that. But that's the biggest difference is, is Morpheus, you know, it's not a device you wear 24 hours a day. It's meant to be complementary to those other devices. And it's really meant to take your recovery mm -hmm. and then give you the heart rate zones to dial in. So if your recovery is lower, it's going to shift mm -hmm. your heart rate zones down. If your recovery is higher, it's going to shift your heart rate zones up. Um, and then the other thing is I've built courses out for people. So I have uh, a Morpheus guide to interval training to teach people how to personalize and dial their interval training in. I'm finishing up here a Morpheus guide to HRV and recovery. So it's going to teach people how to do all these things I just talked about. And then there's the training programs I'm working on. So as much as anything else, you know, I would say Morpheus is the right tool for somebody who wants the education piece about all this and doesn't just want to have a, you know, another device with more numbers on the screen. They want to actually learn how the body works, like all the stuff we've talked about. And they want to learn how to train from a more uh, sustainable uh, direction. And they want to put those pieces together. So I would say if, if, if you're looking for that, Morpheus is... A great fit you know if you don't want to use morpheus and i would just say any sort of sleep trackers is is a good place to start because it'll give you at least a picture of how well you're sleeping and that tells you a lot about your recovery to be honest with you i mean the, the biggest thing you need to do to recover mm -hmm. more is is get enough good quality sleep so if you're tracking nothing else you know get, getting some idea of your sleep is a place to start uh, and then you know using the information from there that's terrific that's at morpheus.com correct Tra train with morpheus.com Trainwithmorpheus.com. Yep. And then, as you know, and we last do the, not, tell me. Go ahead. Tell I'll just say, as you know, we, no, we also please, have. Please, please. Yeah, we also have for the coaches that are listening uh, the Morpheus coaching platform, which is something I'm, I'm really excited and passionate about, which I showed you guys last time in Lucas. Uh, and that basically takes all this lifestyle data, the HRV, the recovery piece, the heart rate zones, and it shares that with the coach and the gym. And again, that adds a lot of important components to that. That, that relationship between the coach and the, the athlete or the client, because now mm -hmm. all that data is shared. There's, there's open knowledge there. You can see how much someone's been sleeping. You can see what their HRV has been doing. You can see if they've trained and done things outside of the gym without you or with, you know, outside of your sessions. So it, it just opens up this huge layer of information that normally coaches and gyms have had no real access to. I mean, without it, you don't know how much people are sleeping or you don't know, uh, what their HRV is doing or how well they're recovering or not recovering. So adding that layer in, um, you know, it's hugely important. And again, I think more, more and more coaches, you know, as we get into this are going to recognize how valuable it is to, to know what your clients are doing and to think about programming as more than just the workout, but also the time in between the workouts as well. Awesome. Well, listen, Joel, that was incredible. That was a, uh, awesome run through HRV recovery and recovery protocols and why it's so essential. I can't thank you enough for being on the show, man. Thank you so much. You helped a lot of people today. Once they hear it, yeah, they any time. questions. Yeah, yeah. Anytime I'm happy to come on and, uh, you know, this is like, I said, I've been doing this stuff for 20 years now on the HRV side and it's been awesome to see the whole thing grow and, and become more commonplace. And there's, there's a need for people to, to know how to use it effectively. So I'm happy to, Come on time and share with your audience and answer any questions you've got and uh, help out. Thank you so much, Joel. Joel's one of the, the smartest guys in the industry, uh, super nice person. He's always out to help people, which is uh, 
what the best trade to have. And I just want you to know, Joel, I may be showing up on your doorstep in Hawaii to come visit. Yeah, come on. We got we got plenty of room, and uh, the beach the beach is uh, waiting for you. So let me know when you want to be here. I would love that. Uh, best best to your wife, and thank you once again. Have an awesome yeah. awesome weekend. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, if you ever you, you have any trips out to Seattle or anything anytime soon or next six months or year. No, I mean I'd like to maybe go visit Luca again and maybe head out to that if uh, if he has me back there. I had a great time there and. Uh, it was just an awesome experience meeting all of you and just sharing stories and, and listening to your stories and basically coming back. It, you know, it inspires me every time I, I go to something like that. And once again, I think Luke is a great person. So uh, it's nice to be around him. Yeah, no, I agree. If you, if you, you know, want to come out and hang out, Luca and I, you know, hang out every Sunday and lift and talk business and we start shooting some more videos and getting content out there. So if you want to come out for a, a weekend, you get time away. I'm, you know, we'd definitely love to have you out there. I've got plenty of room in my house and welcome to stay. So just let us know. Do some helicopter I flying. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah, that sounds I've amazing. got the helicopter in the house, so we can jump in anytime. It's fun. That's, I can't wait to see that, actually. Yeah. That's All right, awesome. man. Thank you so much. Yep. It was great chatting with you and uh, appreciate your help. All right. Yeah, no problem. Talk to you soon. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. See ya.